We're talking with Chris Clark, co-host of the Locked on Chiefs podcast, to find out a little bit more about Mike Kafka, the new offensive coordinator of the New York Giants. What does he bring to the table? How will his system merge in with Brian Dable's principles? All that and more coming up on today's Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Trana, and happy to have you with us here on another edition of of the podcast where we talk all things New York Giants. And today's episode is brought to you in part by GetUpside. Just download the free GetUpside app. Use the promo code TOUCHDOWN to get 25 cents per gallon or more cash back on your first tank. And on today's show, which by the way, if you are making this your first listen or first watch of the day, thank you. But on today's show, we're going to have Chris Clark. He's one of the co-hosts of the Locked on Chiefs podcast. And as I did yesterday when I had Todd Karpovich of Raven Country come on to talk about new defensive coordinator Wink Martindale, I asked uh, Chris to come on and talk a little bit about Mike Kafka, specifically what are the Giants getting in him? This is a former NFL quarterback who has uh, never before been an NFL offensive coordinator. So we talked a little bit about his uh, quote-unquote upbringing as a coach, what he has done in the past, if he's ready to call plays, and more importantly, how his system might marry in with that of the principles that Brian Dable ran in Buffalo. So that interview is coming up in just a bit. Great stuff from Chris. Again, he and Ryan Tracy host the uh, the Locked on Chiefs podcast. So make sure you check them out. Make sure you check out all our podcasts. We have a podcast for just about every team, every sport. Um, we're doing big things uh, at the Locked On Network, including we have coverage of the Super Bowl over at our Locked On NFL podcast. So we hope you will check that out as well if you have time. All right. So before we bring Chris Clark on, uh, just quick programming note. Tomorrow we are going to have a, um, it's actually a show that I wanted to run yesterday and I pushed it back because I wanted to get the interviews on. But uh, I've got a burning question that I'm going to debate on the air. And I'm sure you guys and gals will want to jump in as well. So I'm going to encourage you to push, post your comments after you hear the show, what you think. And then um, that'll send you into the weekend, Super Bowl weekend. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the game tomorrow, who I think is going to win and, and whatnot. Uh, so so that's on tap for tomorrow. And then we go into the off season. The off season will be here. Yes, hard to believe, right? Um, for the Giants, it's been the off season, but football will actually go on hiatus for a little bit, and uh, we'll of course bring you all the latest from the Giants. There should be a big, you know, a big week next week. I anticipate the coaching staff will be formally announced next week. Thus far, no uh, announcements from the Giants, but I think it's going to be next week, and we'll just follow along with all the storylines because there's sure to be a lot of them. So. Make sure you keep it here at the Locked on Giants podcast. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Chris Clark will join us to talk about Mike Kafka, the new offensive coordinator of the New York Giants. Stay with us. All right, Giant fans, we have more coming up on today's Locked on Giants podcast. But first, the Get Upside app, which you can download for free from Google Play or the App Store Offer savings every time you fill up at the pump at participating gas stations. Sign up for your free account and use our special promo code TOUCHDOWN to get at least 25 cents per gallon or more back on your first fill up at participating gas stations. You can cash out anytime you want to your bank account, PayPal, or get an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Again, that code is TOUCHDOWN and that app to help you save when you fill up at the pump is GetUpside. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I am Patricia Trena, and I am now joined by Chris Clark, one of the co-hosts of Locked on Chiefs. And as I mentioned, 
previously uh, in the first segment, Chris is going to tell us a little bit about Mike Kafka, who reportedly is the Giants' new offensive coordinator. And I say reportedly because the Giants, as of this recording, have not made any official announcements. But it's pretty much a, a safe bet that he's going to be the guy. And Chris is going to tell us all about him. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the program with me. Patricia, thank you so much for having me. I I'm, I appreciate it. And uh, I think you're getting a good offensive coordinator. I think, honestly, you look at the situation in Kansas City, and I'm pretty sure that Kafka was being groomed to be the offensive coordinator in Kansas City uh, once Eric Bieniemy got a coaching job. And maybe even as soon as this offseason, because we're still trying to figure out if Bieniemy will be back in 2022. Yeah, I saw that. I saw Bieniemy's, uh contract is up, actually, I think. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised that they let Kafka go? Was his contract up as well? I don't think you can really block it. I think his contract was up, but I don't think you can also block a move that is going to be a you know promotion of sorts in that regard. So I think that's really what it comes down to. But Kansas City, I think, wanted Kafka here because I expect that they thought BME would have been gone two seasons ago. Uh, and you know that's a whole other issue and a whole other uh, problem, but... Uh, I think you're getting a great young coach that I think uh, the Chiefs were expecting to be the, their guy. What makes him such a great young coach? You know, I think it's his experience in the league. He played in the league under Andy Reid for, you know, a season or two, and he had time in the NFL. And I think it's partially that, but it's also he's been around a lot of guys. You have to remember he's been around Matt Nagy. He's been around Eric Bieniemy. He's been around Andy Reid. Uh, he's assimilated a lot of that information into what he is has become as a QB coach. And not only was he the QB coach, but he was also the passing game coordinator for the Chiefs as well. And he was also, um, I believe, he was a backup quarterback for Reed when they were with the Eagles. Am I right? Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. That's where he started, and that's how he knew Reed. So that's how he got involved. I think he was an offensive quality coach for Kansas City for the first couple of seasons, uh, and then just kind of moved up from there once uh, different people started taking different positions elsewhere. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the type of system he might bring. And uh, I'll ask you about in just a little bit. I'll ask you about Buffalo, because obviously the Chiefs and, and the Bills played each other in, in the uh, divisional round. But um, let's talk about the system. Now, Andy Reid, for the longest time, has been known as a West Coast offense type of guy. But I think he, mm -hmm. his offense has kind of gravitated uh, or evolved, I should say, over the last few years. So what what kind of system would you say uh, Kafka has picked up and, and what do you think he can maybe bring to the Giants? Because the personnel obviously is not the same as it is in Kansas City. Right. And I think what you're going to get with from with Mike Kafka is he's going to look at the talent that you have around him and he's going to build an offense around that because that's really what Reed has done. He is, you're right, he is a traditional West Coast guy. Uh, that's his traditional background. But he's looked at the you know people he's got on his roster right now and Patrick Mahomes and Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey those weapons are used better, you know, spreading the ball out and maybe going to more of a spread type offense. So I think that that's what you're going to be looking at is he's going to look at the weapons that you have and what Daniel Jones is going to be capable of this year and kind of address and try to get that offense to bring out the best in the players that they have. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't believe Patrick Mahomes gets sent on many design runs. I also think <laughs> If I remember correctly, uh, Tyree Kill, they have some pretty cool concepts in the playbook mm -hmm. for him. Um, what are some of the things that let's start with Daniel Jones, who, you know, obviously he, he's got that athletic ability. Um, again, Mahomes not sent on a lot of design runs, but how do you think Kafka can maybe marry the two, if you will? You know, I think that it's with Mahomes, it's not necessarily that they don't want him, uh, that they don't think he can run. I think it's more of, uh, after that injury where he got injured on a, you know, on a free QB snake type play, I don't think they want to put him in danger if they can help it. And I think that's really what that comes down to. To me, it wouldn't shock me if they're going to do uh, the same type of thing with Daniel Jones and put him in a situation where he does what he does best. He can run the ball. Uh, he can be effective doing that. Uh, you know, Kafka has been raised in Reed system who has used a lot of RPOs with Patrick. I think that could be something that you're going to be seeing a lot. And that could be very effective, especially with a guy like Barkley in the backfield. Now, just backing up a little bit, since, you know, Kafka was the quarterback's coach there, what impact have you noticed? What, what's been the biggest difference in Mahomes? Because obviously, you know, he's working with him probably just as much as anybody. How, how has Mahomes flourished under him? 
You know, I think the biggest thing that Mahomes struggled with coming into the league was going to be his technique and his his fundamentals when it came to being a passer. And he still struggles with that at times when you look at his footwork. I think that that's something that they have really worked with him on over the past couple of seasons. I think that's uh, something that's, you know, started with Matt Nagy and I think Kafka took up uh, and knowing that position very well because he played it. So he intimately knew the details of that position has really helped. And you've seen Patrick progress in that regard. He Patrick's a little bit different because he has an arm that allows him to make off platform throws and off balance throws. Uh, so he gets away with a little bit more, but mechanics are huge in the NFL and huge in delivering the ball where you want it to go. So I think that that's one of the things that Kafka has helped him with as well. And of course, you know, that offense has made Tyreek Hill a star. I mean, what mm -hmm. are some of the concepts you think that, you know, I think the closest player the Giants have to a Tyreek Hill is, is maybe a Kadarius Tony in terms of mm -hmm. skill set and whatnot. So what are some of the concepts you can maybe potentially see um, Kafka bringing and, and applying with, when it comes to Kadarius Tony? Yeah, it's going to just depend on what they can get with, uh, you know, opening things up on the field for Tony. I think you're going to see some jet sweeps. Uh, I do think that that's, you know, something that Kansas City's kind of gotten away from a little bit lately. Uh, but they love using Tyree Kill in motion. They love using McCall Hardman, who's another similar player to Hill in motion, trying to get an idea for what the defense is giving them. And I think that's another huge thing that Kafka has really seen with Andy Reid is that Reid and – you know, Mahomes and EB are always looking at trying to get motion, trying to figure out what the defense is doing before the snap so they know where the ball is going, you know, immediately. They don't have to, you know, necessarily read. They already know where probably the best option is going to be. Uh, and I think that's how, you know, this offense has flourished so well is because they are doing a lot of stuff pre-snap, and I think you'll see that as well in New York. How, do they do, like, the whole field or is it half field reads or, or you know what what did they ask Mahomes to do as far as the reads go no I do think it's full field I think that you know it started off slowly I'm not going to say in 2018 he was doing full, full field reads uh, but I do think that he has gotten to a point now where it's progressing and he's kind of reading the entire field reading where the safeties are reading if he, if he thinks there's a blitz coming and where the blitz is coming from and uh, you know really you know changing the protections if need be so I think he's kind of got a uh, pretty good feel for everything. And and it's a lot to take in when you're a quarterback and, and that's a whole different ball game because you have to know protections. You have to know stunts. You have to have an intimate knowledge of where all of the players are going and where all the pieces are going. All right, Giant fans, we have more coming up on today's Locked on Giants podcast. But first, BetOnline.net has everything you need to bet on sports and Vegas games this year. BetOnline.net's basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC odds coverage is the best in the business. So head on over to BetOnline.net to see all their special offers, props, and odds, and to place your bets. BetOnline, where the game starts. Now, you've seen the Buffalo Bills a couple of times in the mm -hmm. playoffs, you know, most recently. Um, so you, you've you gotten a taste of what Brian Dable, when he was the offensive coordinator, did with the Bills. How do you envision Kafka's background with Andy Reid and, and what Dable likes to run? How do you envision that marrying together? I think it's going to be very interesting to see how it marries together because you start looking at the talent that you have in Daniel Jones, and that's really going to be the question. Because if you look at what Dable did in that offense – to me, yes, he took advantage of the skill positions, the positional players that he had, but he also really accentuated that offense to Josh Allen. He put in design runs for the QB, and that was so huge because that's something Allen excels at and something he can do very well. Uh, and then he used the big arm as well in different scenarios. So it's going to come down to what Daniel Jones does best. They're going to get, they're going to figure out what they think he can do best, and then they're going to build an offense around that. I do think that. You know, Dable is a guy, and I think it's kind of funny because a lot of people forget he was an offensive coordinator in Kansas City before Andy Reid came to Kansas City. Uh, so he's been around the league for quite a while. And I think that, you know, what you're going to see is he's going to kind of try to do the next version of innovation. But he was kind of hands on uh, and had all looked like most of the responsibility for offense in Buffalo. Uh, and that offense has been very good for several years. How did how has uh, Dable evolved since his days in Kansas City? 
Well, I think a lot of that is talent. Uh, you know, you look back at some of the offenses that he had in Kansas City, and I don't think that the talent was there. You had Matt Castle, you had Brody Croyle at times uh, back before, you know, you had Alex Smith in Kansas City and Andy Reid. So I think part of it is talent, but it's also just a matter of, you know, experience and learning what you can and can't do and what you can and cannot ask players to do. And, and the league's evolved as well since he's been in Kansas City. If you look at the – uh, passing stats. Everybody's passing the ball more. It seems like passing is is going to be the way things go. And I do think that there still is value in running the ball, uh, but it's just a matter of trying to figure out how much can you run the ball just to keep them honest so you can pass as well. Speaking of running, uh, did Kansas City run more outside zone, inside zone? What what, what was their pre- predominant style? You know, I think it depends on who the running back was, and I hate I hate giving you that answer, but that's the reality. Um, Clyde Edwards-Dallaire, I think he ran in between the tackles a lot. So they didn't really use him in outside zone. You got Jarek McKinnon in there, and he did run some inside, but then he would also bounce stuff outside because he has the different set of quickness uh, when it comes to running the ball. Uh, Daryl Williams would be another type of runner as well. So you had a whole bunch of different runners that were going through that offense, and I think they just kind of tailored it more to who was the running back and they called plays that were going to help uh, that running back succeed. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think Kafka's ever called plays before, at least not on the NFL level. I right. don't think he was given autonomy to call plays when he was a quarterback. So that being said, if you had to take a guess, and I'm not asking you to, to, to say for sure, but do you think maybe Dable is going to retain that play calling role, or, or do you think Kafka's ready to call plays? I honestly think that it's uh, the way it's going to play out, at least for the first part of the first season, I think Dable's probably going to continue to call plays. Uh, that would be my guess. Uh, but as being a first-time head coach, it's really hard to know whether or not he's wanting to go let go of that responsibility because there's so much more the head coach has to do other than uh, as offensive coordinator. So uh, I would guess that he's going to continue to call plays at least to start because you don't want to throw a guy in there that's just not quite ready for that yet. And I think they were grooming Kafka to be ready in Kansas City. But the reality is in Kansas City, Andy Reid still has a huge thumbprint on that. So it's going to look a lot different in Kansas City than it could in New York. Yeah, I was going to say, Andy Reid, if I'm not mistaken, calls the plays Mm -hmm. down in in Kansas City. Is that still the case? Yeah, that's generally the case. I think Eric Bieniemy has a huge say in what goes on and and game planning and whatnot. But Eric, but Reed is still calling the plays, so it's a little bit of a different situation. Yeah. So I mean, if so, and I think you're right. By the way, I, I suspect that Dable's going to end up calling the plays for the Giants. But that being said, I mean, how far away do you think Kafka is to being in that position where he could just take full control of the offense? I would say he's probably closer than than we would think, but it's, it's going to be very hard to know because he's getting ready to go into a position that he hasn't had before. He was passing game coordinator in Kansas City. He hasn't really dealt with the running, situ- you know, the running game, and that's going to be something that New York is going to have to build around a little bit with their talent that they have. Um, so I think that's going to play into it. But I also think that you look at what Brian Dable was able to do in Buffalo and uh, you know, he did fantastic in Buffalo as an offensive coordinator with a defensive coach. The difference is Kafka is going to an offensive coordinator or he's going to be the offensive coordinator for an offensive coach. So you have to figure that there's still going to be some of that, uh, you know, play over from the head coach to the offensive coordinator. I would say that maybe after, you know, this next season, maybe they look at Kafka as being the guy that's calling the plays, but it still wouldn't shock me to see Dable calling plays in 2023. Yeah, it wouldn't shock me either. Now, now, one thing I'd, I also want to ask you, because at the Giants, I don't recall them ever having a passing game coordinator. I think they had a run game coordinator years ago. But, you know, f- for those who aren't familiar with mm-hmm. what a passing game coordinator, I, I, specifically, they're calling the pass plays, I would assume, correct? Yeah, it's. I think it's more design and it's more of just game planning and it's looking at film from the previous game from the previous you know weeks for your so opponents, segment. right? And trying to figure out what is going to work best towards that defense. And so I think that's a lot of it. And then you're looking at you know how's your running play is going to play against that defense? How's your passing plays? Because mm-hmm. you have to remember Andy Reid's playbook is extremely thick, uh, so he's pulling from a ton of different plays. And not all of those plays are in the playbook for every single week. So it's just a matter of, you know, what do you think is going to work best against the personnel that you're going up against and the defenses you're going up against? 
So, I mean, it might make sense then mm -hmm. to have Kafka do maybe passing game for the Giants and then just mm -hmm. let him work his way into becoming a full-time, full-fledged, I should say, uh, offensive coordinator. That's what it sounds like. Well, and it almost, sense. yeah, it almost may, and I know this is kind of going against the grain a little bit, but I would almost think that maybe what you want him to do is be the running game coordinator. Uh, go be a situation where you haven't done something before. And, you know, if Dable's still going to be calling the plays, you're going to have some other input there as well. Uh, you're giving him the ability to, to marry the running game to what he already knows in the passing game. Uh, and I think that that could be a way that they go as well. Just really depends on what Dable wants to do and how much responsibility he wants to give away. Some coaches want to continue to call plays. Other coaches want to just be a head coach. And uh, I could see it both ways for Dable. I'm hoping it won't be both ways, but, you know, <laughs> yep. I, I it get wouldn't it. surprise me. But all right. Now, um, a couple more for you, Chris. Now, sure. would Kafka having been a former NFL quarterback, I always see when, when a coach comes in and he's played the position that he's actually going to be involved with, I see that as a plus. Do you agree that that's a plus, even though, again, uh, a little bit of a difference between what Daniel has run versus what maybe Kafka ran during his career? I think it's a big plus. I think any time you get an NFL player that is looked at it from a different perspective, I think that that's a huge plus because when you're playing, it's a different perspective than what the coach has. Yes, you want a QB to be able to have the entire perspective of the entire offense, and I get that, but it's still different than coaching. And you're trying to do different things. You're trying to do different uh, – you're trying to bring different attributes out of players uh, in different ways. So – I do think it's a plus that he's a former player and, and he's played the position before because the other side of it is, is he can look at his players and say, look, I've been in your shoes and he has really been in his shoes. It's not like he played college ball and I'm not trying to throw any of the coaches that never played in the NFL under the bus, but the reality is, is they can relate to what, to him just a little bit more. And I think that helps. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I thought with Jason Garrett, but unfortunately the <laughs> the creativity wasn't there with Jason Garrett. All right, final question Garrett's for you. Garrett's a whole other ball game. Yeah, exactly. Final question for you, Chris. I mean, we've been talking about how um positive, how uh promising Kafka can be. What would be the top concern though, um with getting a guy like him who maybe hasn't called plays before and now is being groomed to do it, especially since now it's a, going to be a marriage of the two systems. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest concern, in my opinion, is, is he hasn't had the experience of calling plays. But the problem is, is you're not going to get that experience until you've actually done it. And unless you're going to hire a guy that was an offensive coordinator in college, you're likely not going to have somebody that has that experience. So I think that's the biggest concern is that, it's, you know, it's – easier to you know plan okay this is what works this is what you know we're kind of seeing from the defense this is what we expect to see these are the types of plays that we think will be effective against their defense that's a lot easier than going in and saying okay it's third down and eight and we're at our own 25 yard line and what are we going to do as a play now don't get me wrong they have hundreds of plays it won't be an issue i think that but it's still trying to find the right pieces and the right weapons and that's the other issue is you know, you have different weapons in, in New York than you have in Kansas City. So you have to be able to tailor your offense, kind of like what we talked about earlier, but you also have to know your players intimately, and that's going to take time. It's not going to be something that will be, you know, something that's going to, you know, take off immediately. I mean, they may see great returns early, but it's still going to be something that likely is going to take, you know, at least halfway through the season for the coaching staff to fully mesh and the players to understand what's going on. Yeah, and, and uh, Brian Dable already said, you know, when asked about who's going to call plays, he said, look, we'll just go through it in the spring and in the summer mm -hmm. we'll make a decision there. So I suspect that's going to be an audition process, if you will, for Kafka to, to call the plays in addition to – and I'm sure he'll have a heavy say in the game plan every week, but, you know, uh, it, it's like – They'll say it's the giant system, but I think a lot of people will still refer to it as Dable system since he is yeah. the head coach and he's of the offensive uh, side of the ball. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that you know, you're looking at a situation where Kafka is going to somebody that has been very effective offensively in the NFL. And I think that's a huge plus. And I will say, you know, three years ago, four years ago, you know, we already had, we heard, you know, the Adam Schefters and the Ian Rappaports and all those people starting to talk about how Andy Reid saw head coaching potential in Mike Kafka. So 
I'm not saying that he's going anywhere in the next two years, but the thought process is, is that they saw a lot back then and it's just progressing. This is his progression to go to the next level. And I do think that he's probably going to end up being a head coach down the line at some point. And Andy Weed has a pretty good coaching tree, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. He does. He has a pretty good track record. Yeah. Exactly. And thankfully, he got his Super Bowl a couple of years ago after uh, not having one. But uh, he's got a pretty good track record when it comes to guys that are coaching in the NFL and former what I guess the Bills head coach was an Andy Reid guy at one time. So yeah. lots of different players, lots yeah. of different coaches. Sure. It's amazing how they all marry together. And, and, and it's such a small, I mean, there's over 300 players and how many, are, however many coaches, but it's, it just seems like everybody knows one another. It's kind of like in our business, how everybody kind of knows one another. So anyway, Chris, thank you so much for the insight on Mike Kafka. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what he brings. I'm looking forward to, to listening to him. I always like to listen to the assistant coaches because they always have so much great information they, they share. All right, that'll do it for us, ladies and gentlemen. That is Chris Clark, co-host of the Locked on Chiefs podcast. You can find him and his co-host Ryan Tracy on the Locked on Chiefs podcast. Like we are doing here at the Locked on Giants podcast, we're, they'll come to you five days a week and they're, they're going to have a very interesting off season, I'm sure, as well. So, uh, Again, Chris, thank you so much for everything. Giant fans, thank you so much for tuning in and making us your first listen of the day. Or if you're watching on YouTube, your first watch of the day. For Chris Clark, I am Patricia Trainer. Have a great one, everybody.